Yes, I did see the clip in which Hillary Clinton says that uh, uh, I think she was saying it was nice to be so close to the uh, headquarters of the Council on Foreign Relations because she didn't have to go very far uh, to find out uh, what to think uh, and how to act on certain issues or something to that effect. And uh, I'm sure she's been embarrassed by that statement and probably has issued some kind of a qualifying statement that, well, she didn't mean it quite that way. But the fact of the matter is I think she did mean it. Most, most people know in politics, they know that the Council on Foreign Relations is the center of all of this, that that's where the power is. And you just don't get the green light to move up in politics unless the switch is thrown in the building there at uh, the Council on Foreign Relations office. That's why all of the major candidates for office appear at the CFR conferences and uh, you can see video clips of them on the internet now and then. They're giving speeches, sometimes before large audiences and sometimes before small groups. But it's clear to me that um, they're brought in and they're uh, treated very nicely and then they're asked some questions to see how they think and how they would act under certain circumstances and what is their view on this policy and that policy. And if their answers are acceptable, they get the green light. Council says, okay, this is a man that uh, we can trust, that we, we can, we can uh, support. If they give the wrong answers, I don't think they're ever going to get any kind of a, uh, you know, a green light. And so people like Hillary Clinton know, even at that elevated position, Hillary Clinton, you'd say, was one of the big movers and shakers. Compared to the Council on Foreign Relations, she's not. She's a small fish. And she knows that she's got to uh, get the approval of the CFR. I think that the... Uh, the people who are monitoring this are, they have to be concerned over the growing awareness on the part of the American people. Um, the question though is, are they worried about it? I don't think they are because we know that uh, they have thought about it long before it ever happened. These people are not stupid. Um, they knew that uh, there would be opposition to their plans as they reach the end of the game. They know that as people begin to lose their economic freedom and uh, they know that as one crisis after another uh, descends upon them, there's going to be opposition. And so they planned on this a long time ago. And I think um, what we're really looking at is, um, I think Alex Jones called it the end game. We're, we're approaching the end game and they have a plan for that and that is to um, to institute martial law because as people become upset they go into the streets they demonstrate and eventually they become unruly eventually they become violent and eventually they start breaking windows eventually somebody gets hurt eventually somebody gets killed eventually there's martial law and that really is what they really want because they want an excuse for martial law. All collectivist systems eventually deteriorate into a police state because it's the only way you can hold it together. So are they worried about people becoming aware? Um, I think they are not because they've been planning on it. It, it. Let's say it this way. They're certainly not surprised by it. The movement toward world collectivist government has been going on for quite a while. Uh, it's, it's impossible to establish its absolute origin, but it certainly was part of the literature at the turn of the last century. And there were groups and organizations forming uh, in various parts of the world at that time that had that as its goal. One of the most interesting groups was uh, one put together by Cecil Rhodes. It was formed by um, his will when he passed away, his vast fortune went to the creation of a secret society and actually what it was. He said we've got to keep this a secret society and uh, all of the Rhodes money went in that direction. Uh, it was from that that uh, the Council on Foreign Relations sp uh, sprang in this country. There were similar organizations in other uh, British dependencies. Um, and uh, they all had as their goal the creation of a unified world government based on the model of collectivism. So th there was this milieu of political and intellectual um, movement starting over a hundred years ago. But it certainly has gained momentum uh, 
through World War I really got up to speed, and then finally in World War II, all of the major uh, players on the world scene were talking about world government. They tried to do the League of Nations, that failed. Finally, they created the United Nations, that stuck. And so now they're just trying to pump up the United Nations into the, the framework of the global government that they have always envisioned. And this has been a, a, a thing that goes beyond one generation. It's, it's transgenerational. In other words, it's not just one person's vision. The people that started it are long gone, but the, those who inherited it continue this dream. To them, I'm sure they look at it as a, as a wonderful thing. They see it as um, an end of nationhood, as it has been historically defined. They see that as advantageous, they say, because it'll put an end to war and so forth. And, um, and they can sell the idea as a great step toward uh, brotherhood and a unified globe and so forth. They use all of these things to make it sound good. But when you start examining the actual policies that they're instituting, it's not so hot. It's based on the principle of collectivism, as I've said several times, and that means it's all powerful government. It's a tyrannical government. It's the same kind of a system that Adolf Hitler had in mind. And we fought a war to destroy him and his system. The same kind of a system that uh, Joseph Stalin had in mind, and we fought a Cold War and, and did a lot of other things to make sure that that didn't happen. The ca same kind of a system that Mao Zedong had in mind and uh, Benito Mussolini. All of the great collectivists of history have had this unified global government based on the model of collectivism as their goal, and we fought against it until recently now we are actually the greatest uh, advocates of it ourselves. We don't call it uh, tyranny. We don't call it fascism or Nazism or communism. We have a better name for it. The name they have chosen is the New World Order. That's their favorite phrase for it. But when you examine its nature and its essence, it is a collectivist system, powerful government, little people at the bottom taking orders. So this is the concept. It's been under evolution for over a hundred years. It looks like it's coming within sight now. Uh, we've seen the nations of Europe uh, amalgamate into the European Union. The sovereignty of all of the European uh, nations has been pretty well lost now to the European Union, and they've always said that was a stepping stone toward the creation of a true world government, is to unite the smaller governments of the world first into regional groupings such as the European Union. They have one in mind for Asia and Africa, and now they're talking about doing the same on the North American continent, called the North American Union, and it'll be a merger of the United States, Mexico, and Canada. A process that they deny that is underway, but it is definitely underway, and it's been underway for over a decade. And um, if you examine some of the um, laws and administrative rulings that are coming out of the federal government at all levels, they often use the word harmonization, meaning they're going to harmonize or attempting to harmonizing our laws um, with the laws of Canada and Mexico. So this process is well underway. Uh, we have seen the, uh, the euro, a replacement of national currencies in Europe, a single regional currency. Now they're talking about the same thing here in the United States. To get rid of the U.S. dollar, get rid of the uh, Mexican peso and the Canadian dollar, and create a new currency for the three. They'll probably call it the Amaro. That's the name they seem to be favoring at the moment. Step by step, this structure of world government based on the model of collectivism is being erected every day. You can look in your newspaper and see evidence of another brick that's been put in place, another timber has been put in place that's going on and on. So is this a good process or a bad process? Is it an inevitable process? Well, first of all, I don't think it's inevitable because it has to be done by people and people have to want to do it or not want to do it. It's, uh, it's well advanced because the people that are in charge, the people we elect, the people who are running our own government, the people who are running the governments of these other nations, at the top, these people are all for it. So that's why it's happening. At the voter level, I don't think most people even know that it's happening. And if they did know, they'd probably say, I don't think this is a good idea.
So the trick has always been how to make this happen without getting the American people or the people in Britain or France or Germany or Mexico or Canada too much alarmed about it before it's too late. That has always been the, the strategy that they have followed. So that, that means they have to deny that it's happening. It means they have to uh, do it behind closed doors. That means they don't bring it up for a vote in Congress. They do it administratively rather than legislatively. And all of those strategies and tactics are being used. Uh, is it a good thing or a bad thing? In my view, it's a very bad thing because I think collectivism is the, is the graveyard of civilization. It's certainly the graveyard of freedom. If you just think about it, no collectivist system in the world has ever uh, been the kind of a place where freedom was uh, prosperous. Uh, people always wound up in the gulag or some kind of a concentration camp if they disagreed with their, their um, leaders. All of these factors, I think, need to be understood in order for us to um, come up with an intelligent plan of what to do about it. Because all of this is you know, academic unless we come up with a plan of what to do about it. And the first step in knowing what to do about it is knowing what not to do about it. And by that I mean what not to do about it is to fall for this left-right paradigm where both the right wing and the left wing are both pursuing this objective but fighting each other. And if we, if we get caught up in that trap, we'll spend all of our time fighting the leftists or fighting the rightists and it doesn't make any difference because no matter which side you're on in that battle, you still are promoting this globalist uh, government strategy. So the first thing to know is don't get trapped in this left-right paradigm. The next thing is uh, to know what you want. It's uh, not enough to know what you don't want. Of course, we don't want tyranny, of course. But what do we want? Well, the average person would say, I just want to be free. Then you'd ask that person, well, what is freedom? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? What is freedom? A lot of people think that freedom is merely not being in jail. That's their definition. If you're not in jail, you're free. It doesn't make any difference if you're not free to live where you want to live or hire who you want to live, hire or, or travel where you want to go or spend your money the way you want to spend it or write what you want to write or go on the internet and say what you want to say. They don't think that's important as long as you're not in jail. They call that freedom. I don't think that kind of a definition of freedom is, uh, is worth fighting for. So we have to know what we want. What is freedom? That's the reason that we created Freedom Force International, because our movement there is, uh, is attempting to define that. We have defined it. We have the creed of freedom, which is, in our view, a very positive statement of what freedom is. And we have the, uh, the commandments of freedom, the things that thou shalt not do, for example. Very simple things, but all of the great movements of history have always started with simple concepts. The freedom movement in America and in the world right now is in very serious need of some simple concepts, some simple principles, some ideas that you can believe in. You know, the old saying is, if you don't believe in something, you will fall for anything. It's very true. And so the first step toward reversing this drift toward global, collectivist, tyrannical government is to know what we believe in what is freedom, and be able to define it, to be able to defend it, to be able to argue against the collectivists and say this system is better than that for this reason, this reason, and this reason. And then finally, the ultimate question is, well, who's going to do this? It's easy to become um, despondent, discouraged, and say, well, nobody cares. My, my neighbor is out cutting his grass. He's a good guy. We talk about baseball. We talk about the weather. We can talk about the latest movies. Um, but he doesn't want to talk about politics. He doesn't care about the economy. He just doesn't want to become informed. And he certainly doesn't want to take any personal responsibility for monitoring and, and changing the system. So how are, you going to, how are you going to fight this great drift toward global government with all of these powerful people at the top and nobody on the street cares? And the answer is that all movements of history have always been determined by less than 3% of the population. You don't need everybody out there. In fact, uh, it'll never happen. It'll never happen. Never happened before in history and it won't happen now and certainly won't happen in the future. 3% or less of the population are always the movers and the shakers 
If you can reach 3% of the people who really care and who really have the mindset and who are willing to make the sacrifices and the dedication to this task, it can be done. And the guy next door will continue to push his lawnmower and he'll go whichever way the system goes. It's always been that way. So we don't need to be discouraged by the fact that not everybody is taking an interest. Our job is to find that one, two, or three percent of the people who do care, get the message to them, join forces with them, and then we have to come to power. Coming to power means we have to get into politics, we have to get back into the media centers, we have to communicate this information to everybody we can, we have to be, let our voices be heard in the, great, uh, in, in the great power centers of society, the political parties, the labor unions, the church organizations, the media centers, and so forth. This is where we, the 3% or less, must go to work. This is where we're going to find the battle. This is where we're going to engage the enemy, and this is where we're going to recapture all the respective countries of the world. There is this false um, um, competition between the left and the right perspective. We've got the, uh, the, the masked raider with the, with the black mask there in the, in the wrestling ring, and then the guy comes in with the blue cape, and, and they go into this great uh, phony wrestling match. And it, it's a great show. It's a great show, and um, they got cheerleaders, uh, the, the commentators, you know, on the left and the right, and um, the public enjoys the game. They, they like watching the match. It's exciting, isn't it? I mean, they throw each other out of the ring, they beat each other up. He's up, he's down, no, he's winning, no, he's losing. Well, he lost this match, but he'll be back next week. Stay tuned, folks, for the next match. A grudge match is coming back, and so forth. This is American politics that we're talking about. Both of these professional wrestlers, they beat each up a little bit in the wrestling match, and they go in the locker room and they, they pat each other on the back and go out and have a beer together and say, well, that was a pretty good show. What are we going to do next week? This is American politics. And we have our cheerleaders, you know, the news commentators and the uh, talk show hosts on the left and on the right, and they frame the debate. They won't let the American people debate the real issues. They won't let them even think about the real issues, which are, are we going to keep American sovereignty or not? Are we going to let the Federal Reserve System, which is a banking cartel, continue to run our government or not? They won't let us talk about those things. So that's the problem. As long as we depend on the phony wrestlers and depend upon their well-paid cheerleaders in the media, to keep us focused on secondary issues, we're never going to get out of this mess. So the first thing is to recognize the problem, see who the opposition is, and then walk away from them.